Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hey, Gardner, how are you? Warren, nice to see hey, you. Hey, Warren, Warren how are you? What's happening? Well, this is not really early morning on a Sunday, but comparatively it is because you just had a rather lovely party. A, well, I suppose a post nam 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 party. <laughs> nam. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. I mean, pretty much everybody I know in Nashville was here last night. Yeah, it was a great hang. Really good turnout. Fun time. Being totally selfish, I must talk about, I sat here for about half an hour and sort of DJ'd selfishly yeah. to a room. I think I lost half of half the people in here, obviously. But Larry Crane, Crane came in in the middle and was like, we share the same record collection. And then we got really carried away. Um, this room is a beautiful sounding room. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's come together really well. Been uh, five months in here now. Yeah. It's amazing. But yeah, you still have the LA location as yep. well. Yeah. So I'm out here, Dave's in LA, uh, same exact setup that you know we had before in LA, we're just two locations now. We're, we've been bouncing back and forth a bunch, yeah. so I've been back in LA, man, almost once a month. Amazing. So, yeah. yeah. It's the first time I came out here, we set up the rooms with you know pretty similar PMC setups. Pete and I have our AES mapping the same way, I can literally, he can come out to LA, drop in, work Tuesday night I flew in had to get a record out Monday morning uh Wednesday morning came and dropped it in took about 20 minutes to get used to the slightly newer generation of PMCs but that's that's what's great about having two rooms that while they're not identical it's sort of the same Pete and I have not the same but similar approaches and uh taste so it makes it easy for us to work <laughs> simultaneously you know halfway across the country it's smart because what's great about you know, the world we live in is we can all work remotely. Right. You can produce remotely. You know, people can send you a vocal stem and off you go. You can produce a track. Yeah. But having a presence in LA and Nashville is, is really smart. I mean, just being here for the full week, we have we have interacted with so many great musicians and producers, engineers and mixers. I mean, it's insane. Maurice, I think, is a very smart man who runs... I suppose doesn't technically run, but runs the operations well, out here PMC, for PMC. PMC America, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's one of the best. I mean, he instrumental in setting up both the rooms here, yeah. you know, here and in LA. He's been right. great, great partner to have. The whole PMC USA team is like, I in I mean, they're incredibly impressive. It's just that degree of support. I think is um, it's not easy to do. You know, uh, Rory and Jordan are both. Yeah amazing and their ability to like come in set stuff up and i think really provide solutions to when we were sort of approaching like well how are we going to do this how do we want to make this so we can have two operations that are you know pete and i got really used to working 15 feet away from each other mm -hmm. and to then try and make like okay well you know how are we going to do this i think that their work and maurice's input was incredibly helpful yeah. you know and well it's the new world we live in it's definitely all about this you know, having a great musical community. Yeah. And to be honest, I enjoy it. I like the music industry where it is now. Yeah. I still want to talk about gear, because even though the, right. uh, not everybody watching this will have seen the equipment that you have, and especially seeing as behind these cameras is actually sitting the lathe and everything. So yeah. I really want to talk about that. Let's do a little... Uh, yeah. Let's do a little geekiness. I can give you the kind of rundown. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about the chain. Okay. Yeah. I'm, you know, it's it's pretty simple. I mean, it's all based around the the Masalek MTC one, so that's our transfer console. We really like it. It's it's definitely got some really cool old school kind of vinyl cutting centric features, like really cool elliptical filtering. Um, all right, for an idiot like me, what is elliptical filter? Right? Well, it allows us to you know one of the issues that you have when you're cutting cutter heads don't without going into a hour-long conversation about that that's another interview cutter heads <laughs> cutter heads don't like to cut stereo low frequency information right. it causes the groove to collapse so this allows us to center that information and uh clean clean it up and allow for allow for a little bit of, better of a cut like basically it's basically monoing the low frequency information sure. depending on where where you set right. it um, it's really hard to cut wide stereo bass and sometimes almost impossible. For the stylus not to pop out of the groove, what it, what is a sort of, when you say low frequency? 
I mean, I, you know, keep, I just say, keep your, keep your bass stuff up the center, keep yeah. your kicks and bass guitar up the center. And like, definitely, I mean, you know, it's, it really depends on the cutting lathe and the cutting engineer, but definitely the stuff below 150 for oh, 150. sure. Yeah. Um, um, so, I mean, sometimes when we're cutting, we have to do some fairly drastic stuff if there's a lot of real phasey weird stuff. But, uh, you know, our, we have a pretty advanced pitch management system on our lathe that can almost cut anything it'll I, figure it out i but. mean a good a good way to do it is like take a record that you love from the era when vinyl was the only thing that was out there yeah. and listen to the side information right. like you know mid-side listening to side information and you will not hear sub from guitars and yeah. overheads Right. And so it's like, there's a reason there were high-pass filters on all those consoles. Exactly. And it's just, you know, the longer the side, and there are not a lot of people cutting short sides these days. Yeah. And so I think that's the big thing. Side gets longer. The longer the side is, the more aggressive that modeling has to be on, on low-frequency information because just inherently, like, groove with. The, like, the physics of making it fit sure. on a record. Yeah. And, you know, so just, yeah. And, yeah I, and a lot of times... It's amazing. You'll be getting something ready to cut, and you'll listen to it, and you're like, oh, it, stuff will pop because you've monoed information that was like you clarified some of your low frequency. It tightens stuff. up, the, tightens yeah. up the mix. We don't, and we don't automatically do that. It, mm -hmm. It's all you know. All takes you know various test cuts and right. a lot of listening to make it happen. But the you know the console is really effective and helps us out a lot. Yeah. Uh, are you question? Are you? Are you finding there are plugins that are doing this any better or worse? Or yeah, whatever? yeah. we we're we're, we're big fans of like Dirk's Brainwork stuff. So we right. use that we use the Brainwork stuff a lot for that. Yeah. Like the the BX uh, EQ is great. The Fab Filter Q is awesome. I mean, high pass the sides and you know in MS. So it really it really depends. Uh, you know, certain things we're using the console for. Certain things we're using digital EQ for. There's actually a, a Brainworks BX control, which is like the V2 and the V3 are the full EQs. The control is mo like, you know, you can mono filter and it's like, you know, it's basically uh, some, it, and that that's just like a simple, if, if someone was looking to sort of like not go down the path of extensive EQing, like that's yeah. a great, that's like a plugin, a really variable plugin. Um, you know that's essentially doing a similar thing to the to this. Right. Should should stress though, like I know we're going we're getting off on this kind of vinyl yeah. cutting tangent here, but uh, I think it's really important to just make your mixes sound as good as yep. you can make them sound. And you know if when you send it to mastering, especially for vinyl cutting, the vinyl cutting engineer will tell you if there's an issue. Yeah. You know, and don't worry too much about it. I think there's a lot of people and. There's a lot of newer mastering engineers that have never cut before that are offering vinyl mastering services yeah. where they're prepping files. Sure. Well, you, ha you, I mean, you can take a guess at what's going to happen when it hits the lathe, but unless you're doing test cuts and watching how the current's reacting to the audio, you're just you're really just guessing. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think it's just make it sound as good as possible. Let the cutting engineer take care of that stuff in general. But I, do, I do, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I do actually think it sounds better when that information is monitored anyway. Oh, well, because for sure. Because you get better width, because yeah. you've got high mids coming out, it feels wider. Right. If it's all murky and there's a bunch of hundred it on gets each muddy. side, it yeah. just turns yeah, into mud anyway. It's, it's better yeah. mixing. And yeah. it comes back to the conversations, you know, yeah. and relationships. Like having a relationship with who you're working with for mastering and for cutting and the, those yeah. decisions that you can have that conversation that you can bounce it back to somebody and say, Hey, what is your final format going to be? What are you guys shooting for? This is stuff that's going to change between the digital version and when we yeah. cut. And if this is really important to you, sure. then maybe this is something you guys think about in a mixed context, you know? Yeah. So, so next up, so stereo width, what, what is, is that an MS? What, what is that? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're basically just broadening the sides or, or, you know, it's literally gain on the sides or the center. Uh, you know, honestly, we rarely use the stereo width on the MTC because I have other options that I like. We're, yeah. you know, we'll kind of get to, it. we're both huge fans of the master bus processor, yeah. which is something that I would have a hard time working without now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But so, you know, kind of our basic kind of rundown of the path sort of in order, um, which I think a lot of people don't like to 
talk about this stuff. Like I was saying earlier, this isn't like this isn't black magic or anything, you know? Sure. It's like finding a good group of gear that sounds great, a nice clean chain. I mean, so, you know, in general, you know, we have the, the Dangerous Backs EQ, really amazing high and low pass filters and just a really nice musical sounding, you know, it, I always, it's it's a, you know, the Backs EQ is like a really sweet sounding old Marantz receiver, you know? Sure. You're cranking the bass and the treble and just making it sound awesome. I have one. <laughs> yeah, they're they're amazing. You know, it sounds great. Yeah. So, um, I have the Marantz, not the Backs. Oh, the Marantz, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And the, this uh, the the NIF EQ the Soma yeah. is a is a um, a valve EQ and it is really spectacular sounding. It's really special. Um, there really aren't that many of them out there kicking around. It's uh, a it's an amazingly creative tool. Yeah, it's like it's impossible to make something sound bad with this EQ. It, it's it. I'm it, sure I could try. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but the things that you're able to do from like a tone shaping standpoint are like stunning. That was one of the big things when I came to Infrasonic, and this the box had come in about the same time that that I joined the studio, and it was just in. It was crazy to me to be like stuff that you know, lots of stuff doesn't need to be pushed, but with this EQ, when you push it, the ability to pull material out that the mix engineer and the producer, or the NR person, is really trying to like draw out like things. I've never used an EQ that you're able to do that in a way that is as complimentary as it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's always trade-offs, but however he's designed that thing, <laughs> it's, you know. I don't know the company at all. Um, yeah. This is new to me, so um, where's yeah, it based? He, is, it, is it, he oh, Finnish or is he Norwegian? He's Scandinavian. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. exactly, I feel That's horrible. Not. I, I don't exactly know, but his, all of his stuff is... It, exceptionally high quality and it's, it's very expensive small batch stuff he also makes incredible synthesizers now you talked is, briefly yeah. you said how important this is yeah. so what is it that you love about this there's a million things i mean my That's my right. whole road to the mbp was really funny because i a lot of engineers kept telling me and friends like you've got to try this thing and you know i've known the guys at rupert me for a long time i used to own a 5088 in my old recording studio i'm a, obviously huge fan of Rupert Neve and his designs and I had heard this thing at you know at NAM and AES and I was like wow it does some cool stuff but you know when you're out on the floor listening to something it's really hard to kind of get a vibe mm -hmm. and I finally got one into demo and the one I got into demo was that one we wouldn't let it leave yeah. <laughs> so um yeah. it, it it's a it's kind of a it's a Swiss army knife box um the you know feed forward feedback compression uh uh, you know, full uh, parallel capability, and it does the, you know, it it does the 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 Neve the R and D silk mode, um, that's really handy in mastering, and the stereo field editor. You know, we were talking about with earlier on this box is really interesting. So you can you know you can adjust the mid side just like a normal sort of mid side adjustment that you would maybe do here but you can adjust kind of specific frequency bands right. so you can do really cool stuff like you can push the low frequency up in the center and just the high mids on the side you right. you know you kick kick up the bass in the center and spread right. the guitars out right. a little bit or or you can push up the vocals in the center um obviously there's a lot of EQs you can do that with too, but this is just a, it's a really nice musical option. And to be able to do it a based around the, you know, in a dynamics chain, you know, so you can think about like, as you do that, like how you're affecting, you know, the, the stereo field on a frequency specific basis into like dynamics, which is, you know, that it's crazy. Like, like literally it's one of those boxes that you pull, you like take it out you're just like, I don't know how I'm doing that. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just like, right. well, you know, and they, yeah. you, and they're like, uh, and there are like options, certainly like digitally or chaining a couple pieces to gear, but it just, it doesn't work the same way that this thing does. I mean, it's really, you know, I mean, you, you like there's so much gear and the longer you do this, I feel like you become sort of like skeptical about, is this really different? Is this tool really fundamentally different than a lot of other tools that, this is a tool that is different. Like both Pete and I, when it came in, we were just like, well, hell, that's not going anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's indispensable at this point. That's I, amazing. I mean, that's sort of how I feel every piece yeah. of gear in this chain. You know, I mean, talk a lot about the the Alicia Alpha Comp. Yeah. Just amazing. 
and you talk about that for four hours. Very complicated Swiss Army knife compressor, and it's, it's an unbelievable tool. Great sounding. The like the signal to noise ratio on this box is. I don't understand how it is as quiet as it is. Yeah. I mean, it's mm -hmm. wild. It is absolutely wild. It's it's amazing. Yeah, and then, you know, we have our, our modded uh, Spectrasonics V10s, or V610s, excuse me, which are great. Uh, those are kind of early in the chain. They're actually right after the, the Dangerous, and we specifically just use those for, for peak limiting. We use just the peak limiting circuit and uh, rarely go into compression mode. The peak limiting circuit is before the before the compressor, oh, it so yeah. it just kind of cleans up the signal going through the rest of the gear. Oh, that's you fantastic! Know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, you've got your own. Uh, yeah, your own on it there. Bill at Spectrasonics, uh, we Bill's worked with him, and yeah. yeah, and did the the pimped out panels and stuff. Nice. Yeah, we're like yeah, got, we need we need the black panels, and he's like, I got this idea, let's do you know, and uh, that's yeah, he's he's really great. We changed a few things. Uh, Threshold's a little bit different on these. So what have we got, these top two things here that we haven't covered? What's this here? Uh, I hate talking about that top piece. That's like my secret weapon. I'll, I'll tell everyone, it's fine. You look on the internet and figure it out. But that is that is an E-Tech bass and treble limiter, specifically designed for cutting. So E-Tech is Ortophone. Yeah. And you know people know Ortophone now because they make DJ Styli. Uh, right. But before that, they were making you know really high end uh, cutting amplifiers and cutting heads, wow. and so this was a tool designed uh, for for cutting specifically. Um, I've used this thing on every probably almost every master, every master that's gone through my analog chain for sure that I've done since two thousand ten. Yeah. Uh, it's I have the whole theory about high frequency limiting the again, would take a long time to go into, <laughs> but uh, we do a lot of, uh, that's at the end of the chain. So, wow. you know, it's really nice to be able to open up a mix and then allow that to kind of nicely soften it up when it gets too loud. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a really broadband, high frequency limiter. I did, I've never, I wouldn't recognize it. There's no logo on it, so. Yeah. Well, there is, it's just covered. <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. And then what do we got going on here? The mastering matrix. That's so, just... yeah, that that's just, a, it's a really simple passive switching system. Sure. It was designed by my buddy Ian McGregor, who works for Undertone Audio and designed for Shadow Hills and Millennia, and he owns Standard Audio. He, he designed the Levelor. So that allows us to have, it just, it just multiplies the inputs and outputs of the MTC for us. Great. So it allows us to send signal to multiple converters, send signal to the lathe, send signal to the tape machine if we want to do layback. Right. Um, and, it, and it gives us, you know, instead of having uh, two analog inputs on the console, it gives us five. Wow. And then I have additional switching over here by the lathe that, that triples yeah, it. Fairchild sitting down there. Yeah, that actually belongs to Reed Shippen. I was about so. to say, I've never seen it before. I was like, did you yeah. just acquire one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we've been kind of playing around with that. I'm sort of toying with different kind of very mu options there. So, and, you know, most of this over here is, this is all kind of cutting cutting related, um, you know, extra VU meters. These are the VG66 Neumann cutting amps. Yeah. Uh, and we have additional metering for our our preview system, which is just part of, of the, the, uh, the way the lathe works. So there's, there's two signals that go to the lathe. There's, there's one signal that goes directly to the lathe that controls the electronics and manages yep. the grooves, and then a delayed signal that goes to the cutting head. Um, uh, nothing super fancy over here. These are just Lambda variable power supplies that power a few modified portions of the lathe. Great. Um, and, uh, that's that's about it. DAT machine, because we do randomly every once in a every while. Once in a while I get a here. box of DATs. Can you do a transfer? Yeah, and, and, and these, yeah. you know, we like I worked on this big Monterey Pop Festival record last year. It's like a lot of the stuff had been transferred, you know, from tapes to DAT, and wow. everything everything's on DAT. So it still you did still a Monterey happens. Pop thing. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So this is a, a 1956 Neumann AM32B. Uh, this lathe has some pretty incredible history. Um, I've told the story a million times, and, but uh, this was an original RCA asset. So RCA New York bought this, I think 
think in 1957. Wow. Uh, my mentor is a guy named Richard Simpson who was actually at the party last night and he was an RCA engineer for years, started off as you know, a, a QC guy in New York and his dad was a big Grammy award winning recording engineer who recorded you know, Frank Sinatra and a bunch of guys and he made his way into mastering. And then he moved with this lathe to California and then when he retired from RCA and went independent, at the time, in the 80s, they were like, you know, they didn't care about these things. It was like CDs. Like these things were going out on loading docks and rusting. And as part of his retirement, like, sure, take this lathe. And um, so I worked with him for years. That's how I got into this business um, about 18 years ago. And I was kind of one of the guys I started cutting that was my introduction to mastering. I started sort of old school, so I started disc cutting. Um, Fantastic. And I, you know, inherited this lathe from him. And the last couple years spent a lot of time uh, tearing it down and rebuilding it. So we in, in Los Angeles, we also had a Scully that we sold recently that was an amazing lathe and just kind of made the choice to go down to one. So yeah, this this lathe has a bunch of modifications. It still looks really old, but everything's controlled by the most modern pitch control system. Look, That's kind right, of part of it right over yeah, there. Yeah, that little box yeah. is... Yeah. Which basically replaces everything in here. It's yeah. funny, like this section here is just... I, I made the decision when I when I was refurbing this, this lathe, I was like, well, I can either eliminate the stand and all the stuff and just make it really compact. And I kind of went the other way. I wanted it to still look like it did in 1956. So uh, these were the sort of the original controls for, for speed, uh, heating, depth, and everything were all kind of controlled from here. And now this is just... Obsolete, just so, but it looks amazing. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> this box does hide some the new yeah. modern um, pitch control motor inside here, but I really kind of wanted to maintain the aesthetics as much right. as possible. So it's being controlled now from here? Yeah. And then all of the electronics, like completely redone, discrete. These are all class A discrete cutting electronics. Beautiful. Um, and uh, you know Neumann SX seventy four cutter head. Do they still make that? They do not. So do you have to have like NOS? I mean. Uh, well, you if it, you pretty much it's almost impossible to find a cutting head now. So to give you an idea, when I started cutting. Um, you could still pick up a SX-74 for sometimes around three grand. Now you would be lucky. I could probably put that head on the market tomorrow for 20 grand and someone would give it to me. But I wouldn't because I would never be able to replace it. It was really difficult. I, I recently had uh, my, one of my previous cutter heads blue and it had been repaired so many times that it, it was just time for a new one. And luckily I bought this off my tech, a guy named Dylan Constanwall, and this was... Uh, a really low hour uh, cutter head. It really, it was rarely used for commercial cutting. He was a technician, he used it for testing. And uh, so I, it was almost a new stock head. And most of these have been rebuilt many times and modified. This one has never been rebuilt. Wow. It sounds it sounds fantastic. But how many the, hours, how long do they last? Well, you hope they yeah. last forever, but they can be rebuilt, it's a little tricky. There's about two people in the world that can do it. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. And uh, the, the a lot of How the people that support, that's people? the problem. A lot of the people that support <laughs> this stuff yeah. are passing on. Right. So it kind of a scramble to, you know, to expand learn. the knowledge base. Yeah. Uh, and the, you know, at the time, in the heyday of vinyl, there was a company called Gotham, which was the distributor for Neumann, and they had reps everywhere. And if you were a mastering house in the 70s, they would, you you had a problem with your cutting head, the rep came over, he gave you a new cutting head, and they brought the other one back, refurbished it, came and swapped it. It was part of the deal. They yeah. just, you were no, no downtime, and that doesn't exist anymore. There's no infrastructure. And even though Neumann exists as a company, there there is no one there that uh, supports any disc cutting at all. That ended in what ninety one. They stopped making the. They shut down the the cutting division in. God, when's the last? The actual last VMS eighty is at a friend of ours facility in Frankfurt because yeah. they had a relationship with Neumann and Neumann reached out to him and said, "This is going to be the last one." Wow. And 
I think that they kept someone on until about 91. Um, so you're entirely dependent. I mean, that's what's happened. That's what's the, with the resurgence of vinyl. I think what's tricky and what I don't sometimes think people fully grasp is that this is, these are antiques mm -hmm. and the whole infrastructure that used to exist because of the way that, you know, industry's work was literally scrapped, literally sold for scrap. Yeah. And so now we're down to really, really, you know, there are not a lot of companies that make the lacquers that we have to cut masters on. There's yeah. no one making cutter heads. Yeah, there are really you know, limited styluses. It's, it's yeah. I mean, there, this isn't, a, it's a lost art. I mean, there used yeah. to be, the, you know, there were used to be many people that understood how to make a sapphire cutting stylus, and it was an art. And a lot of them were, you know, a lot of them have passed on. Yeah. And because because the industry thought this was all going away, they didn't really feel a need to to preserve it. Uh, and it's it's a skill. It's like yeah. being a jeweler, or you know, like if you were a re watch repair guy that only worked on Breitlings and Rolex. It's a it's a a very very specific specific skill and even with the cutting heads they're coils but and but it's a there's a whole very specific process of how to rewind the coils and uh, I mean down to the glue that they use for these components will really affect the cut so there, luckily, there, there's a handful of people working out there's some people toying you know that have designs for new cutting heads and we'll see if they pan out is there other is there anybody building legs there is a there is a company i forget i forget where they're out of i think they're called silly to Sil i mispronounced not it sure there's a guy the, there's there's a there's a prototype new lathe i i don't know how viable it will be for commercial facilities um the there's... the big problem is that you have a machine here that at the time when you bought this, this machine was like half a million dollars in 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 yeah. you know in in the fifties, whatever the number was then equivalent. And yeah. so there, even though there's a resurgence in vinyl, there isn't a there isn't a huge push except for the vinyl purists and the people that want to keep it alive to do spend all this money doing R and D to create a machine like this that they can sell to five people. I mean, there's only so many people that would be like, here's a brand new lathe. How much is it? It's half a million dollars. Sure. And you can start a business cutting records and never make that money back. <laughs> yeah. The money just doesn't yeah. exist. Sure. I mean, honestly, and Dave and I have had a lot of talks about this. Like we are cutting house for the most part. Dave and I only cut work that we master. Yeah. We spent years, um, you know, there were most Final mastering engineer or most mastering engineers don't have lathes. We spent years helping people out, cutting lacquers for people. Now, if you do a project with us, we, we're going to do it from the ground up. Otherwise, it's it's you know there are plenty of other people that will just cut lacquers. But for us, we've spent a lot of time you know and in investment on this machine, and even just the additional wear and tear and the problems you have trying to deal with someone else's unpredictable audio, it just isn't even worth it. So what are, what are these? I mean, the PMC. Yeah, these are PMC BB5 XPDs. So uh, this is the these are the active versions. This is the BB5, and they call this system the XPD because they have two additional 15-inch uh, low-frequency cabinets. Um, and it's their their active system. It's all powered by these highly modified PMC Bryston amplifiers. With oh, with see. with PMC's uh, crossover network. I mean, I was here last night, DJing selfishly <laughs> for yeah. myself, listening to all my favorite music, and they sound absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, they're. I can't remember the exact specs. It's crazy. It's like yeah. zero distortion up to like 130 dB or something. These things are. I mean, you you felt them last night. They're crystal clear, cranked. Yeah. And yeah, if you're not paying attention, you have to be careful. I mean, there you can listen to these for a really long time without fatigue, uh, but they're you know crystal clear, very loud. But I, I think one of the most impressive things about these speakers to me, and I don't know how much it, it was fun to listen to them loud, but I don't know how much time you spent listening to them really quiet. The no bass, the, exactly. <laughs> it's not as fun, but when you're in here, I mean, the greatest thing about these speakers is you listen to them nice and quiet. Guess what? The bass is still there. Low frequency. When I first still came there, into the room, you know? they were quiet and they were great. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, obviously they're impressive and they can really push air, but they're extremely high resolution. Um, 
I, I find so much, and this is the thing I talk talk uh, to about the the PMC folks a lot. There, some people are shocked when they first hear these because the the bandwidth is is full, truly full resolution. You're not hearing rolled off high end and rolled off low end, and or hyped or, or hyped. overly hyped. Yeah. I mean, but when, you know, if, but you hear it if it's yeah. there, you hear it. And it, it's shocking to some people like, when they don't re, when they hear the high frequency contact that con, you know content that is in their mixes that they didn't even really knew existed. Right. So, but for us, you know, these are our microscope, yeah. so we have to be able to hear everything. Well, I think for for many people, if they're working on smaller speakers and especially headphones, yeah, they're hearing this massive scoop, so they're hearing a lot of and a lot of boom, boom and fizz, as we like to say. Yep. Um, and they're not hearing that mid-range in much detail, so it's probably a bit shocking to hear the mid-range come out like that. Yeah, yeah, extreme, extremely detailed. We love them. I mean, you know, it's it's as good as it's as good as you're going to get, as far as I'm concerned, in a in a monitoring system. So everyone has their own preference, and it's definitely, you know, per, it's personal. Whatever you yeah. like to work on, these are these are what I'll always work on. I, I enjoy these. Not every mastering studio I've been to do I actually enjoy listening to the monitors. Yeah. And, and, I, and I wonder that with that sometimes, because sometimes I go to places and I'm like, I don't know how my music sounds. Yep. Yeah. And then I go home and listen to it. Oh, they did a really good yep. job. But yeah. I didn't enjoy being in the room with them. Yeah. And, and I then, think... What's that philosophy? I, 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 I mean, I think for, for Pete and I, and I had primarily worked, or I before I joined Infrasonic, I, I worked for a long time on a, a different brand of speaker in a room that was built around them. And so I was actually skeptical when I came in and because of, you know, and I'm like, oh, the guys from PMC seem great. Pete's fully on board. I'm on board. And what's been amazing is uh, to go back and listen to, to stuff I did and hear that even as it was a change, it's a, it's a pleasure working on these speakers. And that is, I think, if you're in here, and we'll have incredibly long days, and I think that's the thing yeah. that's really important. When you're monitoring a quiet level, the ability to trust what we're hearing, low frequency resolution. Because if you're in for 14 hours and you have deadlines that are really hard now, like really hard, people can't miss street dates, they're like, and the, you know, the times are so much shorter because, you know, they just... Whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the philosophy is, we just don't have time to miss stuff. And so you've got to work. And if you're not enjoying it, and, and it's again, it's what works for different people. I think some people like things to be clinical. And like you said, like, I don't enjoy this, but the results are what matters. I, I mean, for me, what drives me wanting to be here is that I still love this. You know, and so I want to feel like I love what I'm doing while I'm making aesthetic decisions yeah. that can be challenging. By, I heard our friend Rory talking about it last night and just kind of, he's a master engineer and just talking kind of about the, the feeling of the speakers. Yeah. And for him, he's like, yeah, I want to feel engaged. I want to like get up from my chair and start dancing yeah. while I'm working. Like I want to feel the, feel the music. And, you know, that's a big part of it for us, yeah. you know. Love and, it. and you know, we get that with these. And they're, they're fantastic. We're not going to be putting lab coats on. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's just not who... That's not who we are. I mean, it's like, and and I don't want to make it, like it's not a lab. It's not like, this isn't a science experiment. And there are people that it is, and that's how they work and they do amazing work. But that's not who we are in Impersonic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there are times to be clinical and that's what we do during the QC process. Yeah. Like this is still a really musical process and to be able to feel engaged and these speakers do that. I think this is a great way to finish up. It's a great way. Thank you ever so much. Thanks, Warren. Absolutely Great. marvelous. Thanks, Warren. Thank you. Thanks for showing us around. Yeah. I'm going to put a link to obviously the old video, but also to the uh, Rainbow Records video that we did, which oh, you set yeah. up for us. Yeah. Awesome. So anybody watching the lathe process can then go and see what the next step is, because that was a lot of fun doing that one. Yeah. And yeah. I'm wearing my flip flops again, like I did. <laughs> so I went to Rainbow Records with like tons of like vinyl yeah. and oh, hot that's stuff. Great. In oh my, my god. Yeah. And everybody's like, what are you doing? You're crazy. And everybody's like wearing hard hats. And yeah, yeah. Hats. yeah. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit more of an industrial process than a lot of people <laughs> yeah. to think about, you know. Yeah. yeah. So thanks ever, ever so much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a marvelous time recording, mixing, mastering. Leave any comments and questions below, and we'll see you all again very soon.